Hola, buenos días a todas y todos. Vamos a empezar. Hello, good morning, everyone. Let us start with our meeting. It is an early morning for all of us, especially for Spain. So let us start with this opening session. Now I would like to give the floor to our Secretary of State of Culture, Jordi Martin. Despite his tight schedule, he has managed to be here with us so as to open this regional meeting on UCH. Thank you very much, Maria. Thank you very much to all of you for being here. Thank you very much to uh, Mrs. Uh, Krista Picat. Thank you very much and hello to Santiago Herrero, to Isaac. And of course to those of you who are here today and who are also representing the different countries in this gathering, in this summit, so as to ratify the 201 Convention on UCH. I would like to start by thanking the Ministry of Culture and other ministers for their work and their efforts to protect underwater cultural heritage. UCH is essential and vital for humanity. It is true that these days is facing enormous problems uh, from climate problems and economic problems. Therefore, the protection of UCH which probably is the less visible one and the less exportable or marketable, so to speak. It is nevertheless essential because this uh, heritage uh, is a tool for economic development and for the productivity of both our countries and our cities. However, it is true that underwater cultural heritage is not sometimes given this status. This is why it is essential that economic and cultural policies of the different countries are essential for its protection. UCH is a vital heritage because what provides us is essential for the culture of the countries insofar as it is the legacy coming from previous generations and it is a tool for economic, social and economic development and it is also a tool for the development of research and conservation and research conservation analysis of a study of the past allows us to understand the present. We are talking about a heritage that it is under sea. This is the work that you have been doing. We need to continue working on this line of work and the protection of UCH has got a cultural purpose. We have been working very closely with the UNESCO together with the government of Spain. We will be gathering in Barcelona in a main uh, meeting in Barcelona in 2025 and we will be focusing on the culture of peace. Krista was telling me that she is the person in charge of emergencies, therefore you can understand how busy Krista is. We have wars all over the world, conflicts all over the world, very close to our countries. And therefore, I believe that we, from the world of culture, we have to send or convey a message of peace, a message of understanding. Therefore, thank you very much for your presence here in Madrid. And obviously, I hope to see you again in our Barcelona meeting 2025. Again, five. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Secretary of State, for your words, Krista Ambassador. 
exact disaster. I am going to be very brief because our Secretary of State has already provided us with opening words. I just would like to point out some topics for debate, for discussion throughout these two, uh, two days. Our Secretary of State has pointed out how important collaborative work is if we, from a romantic viewpoint, we could uh, rightly say that UCH belongs to no one but to the sea. If we follow the Convention 2001 and ICOMOS, we can say that it is not better or way or best place for its protection than the place where it, it is actually located. Uh, nowadays, uh, UCH is facing enormous challenges coming from climate change, from natural deterioration for the passing of time, and for commercial interests. Uh, the 1901 Convention sets out uh, for some measures and tools so as to protect UCH. Now, also thanks to the contribution of IAC, we have in place the program from the Repu Dominican Republic. We believe in the Ministry of Culture of Spain that that is the right way ahead, working under the ages of uh, international umbrellas so as to enhance our knowledge, our methodologies, our understanding, common understanding of UCH. Therefore, I am fully convinced that this regional meeting, especially devoted to the Convention, will no doubt allow us to go forward in the way towards the protection of UCH. I am sure all countries, all state parties will see how fruitful it is to work together under the ages of the Convention to the benefit of the UCH without having a declaration in mind, a specific declaration from 1972 or 1973. We are working under the ages of the Convention. So again, thank you very much to Krista and to our Ambassador for being here with all of us this morning. Now I would like to give the floor to Krista Pitka who is the representative of the Convention uh, 2001 of UNESCO. Hello. Secretario. De I'm very honored and uh, pleased uh, to be able to um, greet you on behalf of UNESCO at this uh, very important regional meeting. Let me start by uh, expressing our um, very sincere and heartfelt frank thanks to uh, the Spanish authorities, including, of course, the, the Spanish Ministry of Culture, uh, for this initiative to organize uh, the meeting today for the region of uh, uh, Western Europe and North um, America with the aim to sensitize um, us about the importance of the UNESCO 2001 Convention uh, and also uh, allow for a platform for discussion on, on issues that are of relevance uh, in, a, in, in today's world. I would also like to acknowledge um, Spain as a country who is always leading uh, uh, the discussions on preservation and promotion of culture. Um, they, uh, they have, of course, uh, organized uh, a number of meetings, including also the, the future um, uh, Mondia Cult meeting in Barcelona, but they also finance a number of operational projects, uh, for instance, in Latin America and the Caribbean uh, that UNESCO is implementing. So thank you very much uh, for your support. Ladies and gentlemen, in the framework of the efforts to better safeguard our oceans, it is essential that we factor in also uh, underwater cultural heritage, much of which, of course, remains unknown and uh, unprotected. Underwater and coastal heritage is a vital source of knowledge and a link to our common human history. It holds stories of ancient coastal cities and maritime routes, 
seafaring and fishing traditions, but also the profound connections that humankind has always had with the ocean. Furthermore, the underwater cultural heritage value extends beyond the preservation of culture. It serves as a rich source of data and knowledge, offering insights into aspects related to climate change, but also historic events. It is therefore crucial for underwater and coastal cultural heritage to be recognized as an element of, of the maritime world and to be better integrated into marine spatial planning and biomarine protection discussions. As many of you would know, the Mondiacult Declaration that was adopted unanimously by 150 countries participating in the UNESCO World Conference on Cultural Policies and Sustainable Development in Mexico in 2022 declared culture as a global public good, emphasizing the importance of the safeguarding, protection and promotion of cultural and natural heritage. The declaration recognizes the centrality of UNESCO's set of normative instruments in ensuring the appropriate national legislation and policies as well as international cooperation in this regard. Together, UNESCO's six culture conventions provide a truly global framework for the safeguarding of cultural heritage and the promotion of creativity in all its forms, making them indispensable tools for the promotion of peace and sustainable development through culture. The 2001 Convention on the Protection of Underwater Cultural Heritage provides a common legally binding framework for states parties to better identify, research and protect underwater cultural heritage in territorial waters but also beyond, while ensuring the preservation and sustainability of heritage treasures which rest on the bottom of the seas, lakes and rivers. The Convention also serves as a platform for an exchange of information and international cooperation. It offers a multilateral cooperation mechanism on the protection of underwater cultural heritage outside of territorial waters. Many of you would know that the first mission under this framework was fielded to the Skerki Bank in the Mediterranean in 2022, and we are very pleased and excited to to hear that uh, there are countries who would be interested in exploring opportunities to fill the similar mission in the Baltic Sea. As of today, 77 countries are parties to the 2001 Convention and are thus committed to comply with the principles and standards outlined in the Convention. This includes taking legal and operational measures to protect sunken, sunken cities from unwanted interference, informing other states of discoveries and cooperating in protection efforts as well of course as facilitating joint action against treasure hunting and looting outside uh, national jurisdictions. Whereas the majority of the countries in Western Europe and North America follow the principles of their convention, the rate of the ratification of the convention in the group is the lowest uh, in, uh, at the global level. Yet, to address global and transboundary issues and challenges, including those related to climate change and the preservation of submerged heritage, and those related to potentially polluting wrecks, we need global response and frameworks. This is why today's meeting is very important as it allows us to discuss the common challenges related to preservation of UCH, but also the opportunities that the Convention offers to address these. So let me thank you all for the work that you conduct daily for the preservation and promotion of underwater cultural heritage. Your expertise, education and passion are crucial uh, to, to address the challenges that we face. So I hope that this meeting will, will be beneficial and interesting and engaging and thank you for all. Thank you very much, Krista, for your words and for your work in the convention, which is not an easy convention. Now let me give the floor to Santiago Arrero, Director General of the International Cooperation Agency of Spain. Good morning. First of all, 
I would like to thank the Director General of Fine Arts and also to the Secretary of State of Culture for their invitation. It seems that sometimes in Spain things are a bit complicated because there are different institutions with uh, the same uh, competencies, the same uh, cultural competencies. But despite this diversity, everything works, the system is up and running, and we are working in the right direction, and uh, UCH is one of those examples. We have uh, a very good relationship between the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Culture and the uh, Cervantes Institute. We have opened up a way, a new way, non-existent so far, uh, which entails working all together in a common objective, which is the preservation of UCH. This is why I would like to take this opportunity to especially thank uh, Isaac, who is also a very good friend of mine. Thank you very much uh, for his invitation. And when I received the invitation to take part in this uh, regional meeting, I accepted it because uh, I saw the objectives, uh, the first one being the uh, mm, com commitment of Spain with UNESCO uh, countries in the preservation of uh, uh, cultural legacy and heritage. Second, the protection of cultural heritage, especially underwater heritage. And third, encouraging all countries that have not signed the uh, 2001 Convention to sign it. Therefore, thank you very much and congratulations for this initiative. We will work uh, always uh, together with you because I believe this is the main objective to all of us for the future. I would like to conclude uh, with the reflection. We are countries and we countries understand ourselves if we understand our seas because our history, our legacy is within uh, our seas and our oceans. It is uh, true that Spain is a country that, ha that is surrounded by sea in all its coasts and I was um, wondered why are you here? Well, the, this is an easy, it has an easy answer. I've been working in Oslo for three years, and UCH must be understood as a development, as a tool for development, not as a tool for commercial exploitation. This is why it is essential that we countries take the lead in preserving UCH, because UCH is part of a world uh, a cultural uh, heritage. And just to conclude, to finish this opening session, let me give the floor to the Ambassador of Pol Poland uh, to the UNESCO. Uh, just let me tell you that he is invited because he is the President of the Assembly of the UCH. Now, I would like to give him the floor. Thank you very much and good morning. <laughs> My Spanish. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, Secretary of State, uh, Excellencies, uh, dear colleagues, uh, I'm very much delighted to be here, uh, to be here uh, today, not only because uh, uh, I'm in a beautiful city, city, city of Madrid, but also because I do believe that the underwater cultural heritage, as it has been highlighted by, by, by Mr. Jordi uh, uh, Marti, deserves the very same attention as the tangible culture heritage. Everybody, UNESCO is known actually for, for tangible cultural heritage, deserves the very same attention as the intangible cultural heritage, which is gaining on, on, on importance, all this living, living, living uh, uh, heritage. And uh, first of all, thank you very much for this kind of invitation. Congratulations uh, on, on, on this initiative and, and uh, for organizing this conference on raising awareness uh, in Group 2, because when it comes to Group 2, there is a room for improvement, diplomatically speaking, when it comes to the ratification of this convention. And uh, why, why, why we, you should ratify, why, sh why should you, why uh, you should ratify this convention? There are three or four uh, very, very fundamental reasons. First of all, if you look at the map, right, at the map of the world, Europe is just a peninsula attached to this 
huge Euro-Asian uh, uh, continent. Europe, particularly Western Europe, group, group one countries, are surrounded by seas and oceans. And as Mr. Santiago Herrero has said, oceans and seas have shaped our history. Not only Spain, but actually the whole Europe and, and Poland, also the Baltic Sea play, played a crucial role in, in the history of, 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 uh, of Poland and the history of uh, uh, our part uh, of, uh, of, of Europe. Which means that protecting and safeguarding the, the underwater cultural heritage is safeguarding our own legacy is safeguarding what makes us who we are right now. So this is the first reason. The second reason is, and it has been also highlighted, I guess, by uh, it seems to me by, by Minister Short, Shorty uh, Marty, is a tool of economic development. It's a tool of economic sustainable development, because in case of both tangible and intangible cultural heritage, all these initiatives to protect and to safeguard this heritage, it's a, that's a joint, that's a joint uh, uh, mm, commitment, not only by the governments, right, the Madrid, you know, the, the, the national level, but also of the local communities. And the culture generates, to large extent, uh, uh, our, our, our incomes. And the third the fed reason is that the cultural heritage, the protection of cultural heritage, based on my, my experience when I'm also from, from Warsaw and I was also dealing with, uh, with cultural heritage, is that uh, all actions aimed at safeguarding cultural heritage brings, bring together the local communities, which is of the utmost uh, importance. And it is also a case of, 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 uh, uh, of protection of underwater cultural heritage. And the fourth reason is uh, the underwater cultural heritage protection is and can be an important tool of, uh, of, a, foreign, uh, of a foreign policy. And the best example is uh, 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 assistance provided by Spain to this underwater culture protection program in Dominican, Dominican Republic. So at least there are four reasons that you should consider ratifying, acceding to this underwater cultural heritage. Now, the dear, dear excellencies, the dear, 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 dear colleagues, the UNESCO 2001 Convention on the Protection of Underwater Cultural Heritage stands as a landmark international uh, agreement aimed at safeguarding our submerged treasures. It is the first legally binding instrument that provides a framework for states' parties on defining, identifying, researching, and protecting the underwater cultural heritage. The convention also emphasizes the need for sustainable practices ensuring the preservation efforts do not compromise the integrity of the heritage itself. The preamble of the convention acknowledges the importance of underwater cultural heritage as an integral part of humanity's cultural heritage and a crucial element in the history of peoples and nations. The underwater cultural heritage is a testament to our shared memory and a tangible proof of our past. Protecting and preserving these historical relics enhances our understanding of culture, history, but also science. The underwater culture heritage faces nowadays numerous challenges and threats like pressures, hunts, looting, uh, commercial exploitation. It is also particularly vulnerable to the climate change, pollution, exploitation of natural resources, and uh, the fragility of these submerged cultural assets requires our urgent and collective action to ensure the protection and preservation. As we gather here today, let us acknowledge the critical importance of the collaborative efforts. Protecting our underwater cultural heritage cannot be the responsibility of just any single state. It requires the concerted efforts of the international community including governments, uh, academia, 
professional organizations, uh, local communities, as well as uh, uh, civil society. Together, we must to work to implement and to promote the principles of the UNESCO 2001 Convention, sharing knowledge, resources, and best practices to safeguard these underwater treasures for future generations. Excellencies, dear colleagues, furthermore, technological advancements offer us unprecedented opportunities to explore and study underwater sites in ways previously unimaginable. Innovations in underwater uh, archaeology, remote sensing and marine technology are opening new frontiers in our understanding of submerged culture heritage and new frontiers in understanding our past. We must harness these technologies to enhance our conservation efforts, ensuring that our approach to preservation is as advanced as the tools we employ. As the chair of a meeting of the state's parties, and thank you for having and trusting me this role, I would like to focus on your attention on the important role the meeting plays in the implementation of the conventions and the ways forward. According to the rules of procedure, the meeting of the state's parties elaborates, discusses, and approves the operational guidelines of a convention, a document that guides and strengthens the convention's implementation. The meeting also receives and examines reports from the state parties on the measures taken with regard to the scope of a convention, addresses their request for advice, seeks means for raising funds, elects members of a scientific and technical advisory body, and takes any necessary measures to advance the convention's objectives. Dear colleagues, my own country, Poland, attaches a great importance to protecting the underwater culture heritage and continues to strengthen the implementation of the 2001 Convention. And we, and we ratified the Convention in 2021, so just three years ago. And now we are advocating for better visibility and promotion of this document, which aims to preserve our common heritage and raise awareness of the challenges it tackles. These challenges, let me stress again, cannot be addressed individually, but require collective action. On the occasion of the second anniversary of the ratification, uh, delegation, my delegation to, to UNESCO, Poland's delegation to UNESCO, together with the National Maritime Museum in Gdańsk, we organized the exhibition Underwater Archaeology in Poland, History and uh, Perspective, and the Baltic Sea has uh, extremely rich and diverse underwater cultural uh, heritage. Dr. Robert Domjo, the former director of the National Maritime Museum in uh, Gdańsk, was elected as, elected as the first Polish member of a scientific and technical advisory body to the convention. And uh, this year, actually, it was uh, two weeks ago, if I'm correct, uh, Rafał was, uh, was, was elected uh, as the chair of scientific technical uh, of scientific and technical advisory body, and, and we are very happy uh, for that. And Rafał is, was elected in, of, obviously in, in his personal capacity, but uh, but also it, it proves our Poland's uh, commitment to advancing the goals of and values of the uh, uh, convention. The National Maritime Museum in Dines, entrusted by the Ministry of Culture and National Heritage of Poland to implement the convention, the convention is considering to organize an international UNESCO Baltic Sea mission to research wrecks located in the exclusive economic zone next year. For the past four years, the National Maritime Museum has been also working on establishing a new branch that it take dedicated to underwater archaeology and Baltic fisheries in, in Weba, at this uh, beautiful uh, sea town in, in Poland. In the coming years, the museum aims to establish a second degree UNESCO center in uh, uh, Weba uh, to support education and popularization activities in underwater archaeology and protection of Baltic Sea underwater culture heritage. So the building is, so, uh, is, is already, is already uh, ready and we are, we are in the process of uh, uh, organizing uh, uh, exhibition. Uh, to conclude, let us reaffirm our commitment to protecting and preserving underwater culture heritage. heritage. By doing so, we honor the memory of our ancestors 
enrich our understanding of human history and ensure that these invaluable cultural assets continue to inspire and educate future generations. And I wish to thank you for dedication and passion for this important cause, and I look forward to, 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 uh, to very fruitful uh, this discussion. And uh, uh, I do, I'm, 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 I'm convinced that uh, that's a matter of, 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 of time when uh, the underwater cultural uh, heritage uh, uh, will gain the very same attention, not importance, because, because it is equally important, but the, the public attention, the attention of our, our governments as tangible and intangible uh, cultural heritage, because we are all coming from, from the seas and, and oceans, and particularly we are coming from the oceans in Europe. Europe, it's, it has been shaped by, by the oceans, by, by, by rivers, by seas. So once again, uh, shout out to, uh, to the Minister of Culture, uh, uh, and, and UNESCO for, for having organized uh, this, this conference. I, and I do hope that uh, uh, this conference will result in increased number of ratifications of the conventions in Group 2. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. Bueno, pues eh, muchas gracias a... Thank you very much, Krista, and all of you for this uh, opening session and for your words. So this uh, meeting is uh, formally opened. So let us uh, continue. Again, thank you very much. And now I would like to invite to the stage the speakers of the first panel. Thank you very much. Laden, Laden, he loses the plane uh, of Frankfurt, so he's coming this afternoon. Don't worry that he's coming, but he, he, he won't be now. Let's take out this. Bueno, pues ya empezamos las jornadas propiamente. El contenido. Good morning. We will start with the scientific and technical contents of our meeting. I would like to especially thank the team of the Ministry for the work which has been a really uh, heavy and uh, intense work that done by Pablo, Paloma, Marta and Christina, as well as Carmen. They have been working really hard for several months to organize this meeting. It was kind of uh, last-minute kind of uh, 
uh, arrangement of the meeting. I also would like to thank Edward Allison, who cannot be with us today, as well as Santiago, who has also worked uh, on a daily basis for that. So I would like to start on discussion. And now we move on, and we will follow um, well, we will start by discussing the legal framework, international framework for the convention. So we open the first panel, uh, chaired by um, Madam Chair Carmen Alcedo, head of the legal advisory unit from the Spanish Ministry of Culture. She was one of the crucial persons for the, uh, our case of our fragat. Señora de las Mercedes, it was a legal case that Spain won over the ha treasure hunters. She is the, well, the head of the legal advisory of the Ministry of Culture, as I said. And, uh, well, she has a tight agenda, VC agenda. She is the one that she knows the most in terms of the legal status of UCH in Spain. So, Carmen, you have the floor. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Maria. I would like to thank the DG of uh, Cultural Heritage and Fine Arts, especially Maria, for allowing me to chair this uh, panel. As Maria said, I am the state uh, lawyer and the head of the legal advisory unit of this ministry. I've been in this ministry for 28 years now. My first approach to the law of UCH were always from the national uh, standard or viewpoints, and the problems that we interpreted and they reported about were about competences between the state and the autonomous regions and internal legal issues. It was then in 2006 when the Nuestra Señora de las Mercedes uh, case came about and the legal case that we uh, was uh, in, dealt with in Florida. After the, that time, I started to understand the international relevancy of uh, that pro rele uh, protection, and then we had the ruling in September. February 2016, then we had the 7 million of uh, um, discovery of uh, cultural goods in the uh, vaults. And there was a case about that in a court in La Línea de la Concepción in Cádiz for smuggling. And then the judge decided that that should be put on the, <coughs> that there was, there should be a uh, legal secretary in that uh, register. And I said, well, I'm going to spend two to three months seeing how they are counting coins. And then my vision, my viewpoint changed. I could see all the conservators and all the archaeologists, and I learned history, I learned about commercial trades, I learned about trade, therefore I broadened my horizon. And then I understood that that was a Spanish cultural heritage and mankind cultural heritage, that that was beyond legal legality of it. Therefore, I started to understand about in situ conservation, questions that if you look at them from a legal, uh, strictly legal domestic viewpoint, I just did not understood, didn't understand. But as of then, I started to understand the relevancy of Convention 2021 from UNESCO. And in the first panel, we will precisely discuss the legal aspects on, that, on our convention, which is a milestone and a key element for delivering legal protection. And for that, with me, well, initially we were expected to have four panelists. There are three, uh, only as the last person could unfortunately cannot be with us. There was a person, a speaker coming from uh, Croatia, and Midland Pesek will take part in other, another round table later on in his conference. So the three speakers will tell us about the legal challenges and the, well, what the convention uh, lays out. Mariano Adna is a chair 
of International Relations of Jaume I de Castellón. She is a member of the Scientific Commission of the National Plan for the Protection of Underwater Cultural Heritage. He is a representative to UNESCO in the group of state parties to 2001 UNESCO Convention. And he is also a member of the International Committee of Underwater Cultural Culture of High Commons. He is of counsel for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, EU Cooperation, and Ministry of Culture. Secondly, we have in our panel uh, Tullius Cobazzi. He is the uh, well, he is Tullius Cobazzi. He's now retired but he continues to be a professor. Professors never retire. He is a professor, was professor in international law in some Italian university. He occasionally participates as a legal expert in international negotiations and meetings related to the sea, the environment, cultural properties, and human rights. Edward Plant, he's got a long uh, bio. And I uh, would like to highlight his double specialization, both in inter public international law and art history, which are the two disciplines that are necessary to have a full understanding of legal culture and art. And since 1998, he joined the UNESCO, and he has had several responsibilities. And also, he has collaborated in five of the six conventions of UNESCO for the protection of uh, cultural he heritage. Since uh, from 2008 to 2018, he always saw the program to combat illicit trafficking in cultural objects and for the restitution. In 2018, he assumed the responsibilities of advisor for culture and head of unit in UNESCO Regional Office for Science and Culture in Europe. And since 2022, has been head of unit of underwater cultural heritage within the entity for culture, the majesty of UNESCO culture sector. The three of them surely will um, discuss with us a number of legal issues when it comes to the implementation and practice practical execution, as well as the challenges of the Convention. Let us give the floor first to Professor Adnan. He will um, th he will tell us about the issues that are being found with the <coughs> status of sunken vessels, the legal status of state party of state vessels, sunken state vessels. We give the floor to Professor Adnan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carmen, for your introduction. And as it couldn't be otherwise, thank you very much to this ministry, this ministry for organizing this, this meeting. And as Maria said, we always like we always thank the major authorities and that are here with us today. And you did that already. And Pablo, Carmen, Marta, Paloma, the people that have making this conference possible. And also, the most important people that are participating here, which are our interpreters. Without them, this would not have been possible. We need them for the time being, up until the Chinese come up with a new invention. We need them. We need humans to establish a, a communication well, a bridge of communication. But, so, Two of the main questions will be discussed in this panel, which were most likely the main reasons for which many state parties or many states are yet considering the potential ratification of the Convention. On the one hand, we have the question of the 2001 Convention and the uh, the law of the seas that Professor Tobacci would refer to, and second reason that I will tell, discuss for the next uh, minutes, and I will not stay longer uh, than 10 minutes. Oh, this evening we have a football game between Spain and Italy. I just don't want Carmen to show me the red card. And I will be discussing the uh, legal status of sunken state vessels are more specifically war vessels. As you well know, 
This was one of the most debated questions, not only during the process of negotiation in Paris at the UNESCO headquarters but, or seats, but also when it, it, it was a convention was proposed in the Buenos Aires uh, uh, 1992 and 1994 meeting. And then it was, uh, as such, it was transferred to the Paris meeting, and therefore a double decision was made. On the one hand, understanding that state-sunken vessels, other than the specific characteristics, could also be considered UCH, based on the actual definition given by the future convention. And second, the second major question, or idea, was or, to avoid from the beginning that the convention lays, the, laid down issues about the title or the abandonment. That question before it reached Paris had been debated significantly and continued to be debated in Paris. And then after the second experts of meeting in 1999, it was adopted. Therefore, the sunken state of vessels became part of the uh, convention and and then the question of ownership of uh, ownership title or abandonment. There came a time then, and this is the reason why the UNESCO Convention in, about culture is the most complex of all, as it touches a very special or sensitive issue, which is the law of the sea. Professor Escavacci is an expert on that uh, law of the sea, and it is difficult to accommodate the different uh, viewpoints of the legal status of a state sunken vessels and also the applicable legal uh, regulations applicable to territorial seas of the uh, uh, states by applying the Article 7 of the Convention. Despite all those efforts, all the claims, demands of the requirements of the different states could not be accommodated into the Convention. For some states, paradoxically, the Convention did not rightly protect the interest with regard to the estate, sunken state vessels when they were in territorial waters of a third party, Russia, Russia declaration after adopting the uh, uh, voting the adoption of the Convention, but that was also followed by the U.S., and some parties said the Convention does not protect my sunken state vessels. It does not establish that those sunken state vessels in the territorial waters of a third state continue to be my ownership. And paradoxically, for other countries, I'm showing that on the screen, on the Colombia made uh, just the opposite declaration. The Convention does not protect the rights of coastal states. That is to say, they consider that everything that is in the territorial waters, including third parties and state vessels, are, uh, belong to the, the, the state of the territorial waters. So this leads me to think that actually the Convention managed to achieve what the first negotiators wanted to achieve. That was to say, to be neutral in terms of uh, ownership and title, legally neutral. And what does the convention says? As you all know, you are all aware of the final decision about the use of the conventional uh, conditional tense should inform should inform countries as well including Spain said that the countries should inform the flag state party of therefore 
they were considering a duty of notification on part of the coastal states about what was happening in their territory. Territorial seas is part of the state territory and, they, and powers defended in the beginning the duty for coastal states to notify to third parties what was happening in the territories. I understand that nowadays, well, despite exceptions in international law, that does not accommodate well in international law. On the other hand, the coastal state and what was finally successful was the defense of the application or execution of a basic principle, of, which is the principle of territorial sovereignty. Actually, does that mean that the text of Article 7, Paragraph 3 entails automatic transfer to coastal state of the title of the flag state on sunken state vessel in that territorial sea or territorial waters of a third party country? I don't think so. Article 7.3 should not be deemed as a clause for acquisition of transfer of title. But just as an article that respects something which is unquestionable, which is the sovereignty of the coastal state on the sea territory. And actually, when it comes to interpreting the Article 7.3 by following the rules for the interpretation, should be taken into context, interpreted within context. What the Convention says regarding sunken state vessels in other areas, not only territorial waters. If we notice Articles 10, 7, the first one, which is about the protection of UCH in the economic exclusive zone and uh, continental platform, it advises that no activity targeted at state vessels cannot be carried out without the previous agreement of the uh, flag state. And then if we move on to Article 7.12.7, it is even clearer when it says that no activity can be carried out, uh, activity for state vessels found in the area cannot be carried out without the authorization of the flag state. In any case, from that contextual interpretation, and from Article 7.3, it is not a clause of, for the transfer of title, yet it acknowledges uh, right and, and legal interest on the part of the flag state. And the Convention also highlights something that is important, that is to say it is not the Convention that decides what belongs to who, who is the owner of the rights. The convention in a clause that is laid down in Article 2.8 establishes the following, that the question of the legal title would be resolved according to the rules of the international law, including the UNESCO agreement on United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. So therefore, the Convention says, do not take my name in vain to discuss the issue of title. If you want to find the answer about who is the owner of a sunken state vessel in the territorial waters of the third party, you really need to recur to the state practice and to the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. And what does international law say in that regard? That is based on a practice that whether we like it or not, and I believe it is not fully final, it is a practice that could we could perfectly state that it is generally accepted by a clear group of uh, states, that is to say, uh, those of us present here, group one and group two to the larger state. But if we check 
or compare that with the practice of other states, more specifically those of group three or five, practice, that practice is quite different. Out of the 77 state parties of the convention, we cannot find a large majority of countries supporting the stand stands supported by group one party countries. I understand that it is not necessary nor pertinent the defense of the rule that we keep, that we uh, comply with according to international law. This is an applicable law or a law in force. Sunken state vessels, despite the place where they were sunken and despite the time of the length of time passed, it continues to be owner of the flag state. It continues to be owned by the flag state. The defense and implementation and enforcement of that rule has been very useful, especially to two parties of Group 1, Spain and France. And also, in particular, two legal cases against treasure hunters of the US. In application, when we applied that rule, Spain could recover the rights about fragats one and Calva, and also that uh, case of La Mercedes, and France used that principle before the US courts where France was acknowledged the ownership of a uh, sunken state war vessel, sunken in US water, Trinité. But in the cases where the legal cases are not between a state and treasure hunters, but in the case where the loose lawsuit takes place between two states and the international courts, I consider that the best option without forgetting the defense of that rule is one of the most intensive cooperation between the coastal state and the flag state. Cooperation which is a duty according to Article 2 of Convention 21 and also according to Article 301 of UN Nations, UNCLOC. That is to say, where states have the obligation to cooperate and protect UCH. And within that duty, within the framework of that duty, what it needs to be done is to accommodate the rights that may emerge uh, sometimes and that may be deemed contradictory, or may be seen as contradictory. Therefore, I continue to think that the actual convention It is not the legal text offering a clear response as to who has the ownership of uh, sunken state vessels. Then in any case, international practice requires review and analysis to see where it is being headed. Practice, uh, seeing, we are seeing more and more cases in practice where that question continues to be discussed. And without giving up on the stance where the flag state, unless express abandonment, should continue to be the owner of sunken state vessels, what we are talking about when we are confirmed confirming or acknowledging ownership of sunken state vessels, it is not only a legal question about the title who, whom they belong to, but we should also consider if we are the owners of the sunken state vessels, we are also responsible of what may happen with them. And we should not forget that most of sunken state vessels, including many war vessels, are marine grave sites and therefore need a special treatment and consideration which is oftentimes forgotten. 
So if we are defending the legal ownership, we are also responsible for preserving that place of honor. So not only that, a sunken state vessel could become a source of marine pollution, could also be an obstacle for navigation, and could also become a danger for the oceans in terms of uh, the environment. Well, a few months ago, we gathered in London out of the 8,500 shipwrecks potentially polluting, some 40,000, 4,500 are sunken war state, state vessels. They were sunken at the First World War and within their holes, they continue to have fuel, also ammunition and other potential polluting sources. They sank during the First World War and now they are gathered or covered by the UN Convention. All these sunken state vessels potentially polluting that were sunk in during the Second World War in 20 years from now will also fall under the umbrella of Convention of UN. And well, 20 years come pass uh, very fast and then we will very soon will be facing that problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mariano. We will uh, dwell on those interesting questions. And now we'll give the floor to Professor Tulio Scovazzi, who will tell us about the main concerns of reluctant states to the 21 Convention relationship with UN CLOS, the conflicts between uh, those instruments and how to conciliate to avoid commercial or uncontrolled exploitation of UCH. To speak to such a distinguished audience, I, I wish to thank the Spanish Ministry of Culture and UNESCO for the invitation. It's also an opportunity to meet several friends, uh, including some who participated in the negotiation. I remember the negotiation. I attended it as legal expert of Italy, and it was quite a, a difficult uh, negotiation. So the subject of my intervention is the relationship between the underwater convention and uh, the UNCLOS, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Is uh, the underwater convention in conformity with the UNCLOS? Question mark. Uh, I would say that it is. If we look at five out of the six official texts of the UNCLOS, and it is not. If we look at one, the English official text of the UNCLOS, in particular Article 303, Paragraph 3 of the UNCLOS, that could be understood as an invitation to the looting of underwater cultural heritage. Speaking about the UNCLOS, it is a monument of codification of international law of the sea. It is a, a, a big treaty, 320 articles and nine annexes, and uh, it has many merits, but we can understand that uh, there could be some single provisions that are not fully satisfactory, and in my view, the worst in the UNCLOS is Article 303, Paragraph 3 in the English text. Go to this article in the uh, maybe later, maybe, may, maybe uh, later. So let's start uh, from the 
beginning. In, in my view, the underwater convention is a good treaty, but it becomes an excellent treaty if we look at Article 303, Paragraph 3 of the UNCLOS in the English text, because the UNESCO Convention is the only remedy that we have to fight against this counterproductive interpretation of the UNCLOS. So, in general, there are some provisions in the Underwater Convention that can be seen as uh, a simple specification of some obligations that already exist according to the UNCLOS. For example, Article 303, Paragraph 1. I need the help of my friend Mariano, who not only is an expert in electronic means, but also <laughs> is a, an authority in the field of uh, underwater cultural heritage. And uh, so in the UNCLOS, Article 303, Paragraph 1, we have an obligation to protect the underwater cultural heritage and to cooperate for this objective. And the Underwater Convention can be understood uh, as uh, a specification of the obligation to protect and cooperate uh, for the underwater cultural heritage. Uh, another example of conformity between the two treaties is that under, under the UNCLOS it could be seen as implied that states have full rights over the underwater cultural heritage located in their territorial sea and this right is fully specified in the underwater Convention. Then there are some uh, examples uh, in uh, the uh, Underwater uh, Convention of progressive interpretations of some principles that can be read in uh, the UNCLOS. For example, in the UNCLOS, in Article 149, it is stated that states should preserve the underwater cultural heritage for the benefit of humankind. And there are no implementing provisions of this principle. Why in the underwater convention it is uh, clearly stated in Article 2 that underwater cultural heritage shall not be commercially exploited. It shall not be used for private commercial gain. And uh, in, in the Annex, uh, uh, Rule 2 uh, of the Annex, it is uh, clearly stated that the commercial exploitation of underwater cultural heritage for trade or speculation is fundamentally incompatible with the protection of underwater cultural heritage. So the benefit of humankind means use of the underwater uh, cultural heritage for public purposes for research, for exhibition to the public, not for private commercial gain. Then in Article 149 uh, uh, of the UNCLOS, we have the idea that some states uh, have preferential rights over the underwater cultural heritage because they are in a particular link, in a particular position with the heritage, that uh, they are the state of cultural origin, the state of historical origin. And in the Underwater Convention, it is clearly stated that states which have a, an identifiable 
link with the heritage are have preferential rights and they are I in a better uh, position to engage in the protection of underwater uh, cultural heritage. Of course, uh, the, there is no definition of uh, um, identifiable link because it would have been impossible to give a precise definition of identifiable link. But nevertheless, some states which have a link with the heritage are I in a better pro position. And then what is uh, uh, the problem? The problem is given by Article 303, Paragraph 3 uh, uh, of the of the ANCLOS. If you read it in the English official text, it says, nothing in this article affects the law of salvage or other rules of admiralty. What, what does it mean in English? In states of common law tradition, we have a body of law which is called admiralty law, because in the past, in England, the admiralty courts decided maritime cases. And this body of legislation is a customary legislation. It is not made by written rules. And according to admiralty law, we have two parts of admiralty law, the law of fines and the law of salvage. According to the law of fines, if someone finds a, a wreck or an object in maritime waters and the owner of the object cannot be identified, the finder becomes the owner of the heritage. That's law of find. The law of salvage applies in cases where we know the owner of the heritage. And in this case, the, finer, the finder gets a right in rem over the object. And until there is an agreement between the finder and the owner about the reward to be paid to the finder, the finder gets this right over the object. So this body of legislation is applied, especially by United States courts, also on wrecks and cultural heritage. In other country, salvage means uh, to save uh, already navigating uh, ships. It, it does not apply to ships uh, which have been lost into the sea since uh, many years. But according to the tradition of admiralty law as applied by American courts, uh, admiralty law covers also wrecks. So if it is applied, it means freedom of fishing for underwater cultural heritage. It means the application of the principle first come, first served to the underwater cultural heritage. In the other official text of the ANCLOS, the meaning of the provision is completely different. Why? because it was impossible to provide a precise translation of some technical expression such as law or salvage in other official languages. Because this concept, this legal concept, does not exist in the tradition of other states. So if we look, for example, at the Spanish text, of Article 303, Paragraph 3, it says, Nada de lo dispuesto en este artículo 
afectará a las normas sobre salvamento u otras normas del derecho marítimo. Uh, maritime law in general, not salvage law. So it, this provision can be understood in a very different meaning. Nothing uh, provided for in Article 303 uh, affects uh, uh, other rules of maritime law. For example, the rules on preventing uh, collisions between ships. It has a completely different meaning. It, 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 it cannot be understood as an invitation to the looting of underwater cultural heritage. So, in short, uh, the purpose of many states negotiating the underwater convention was to prevent such a counterproductive interpretation and application of the ANCLOS to avoid the destination of the underwater cultural heritage to the satisfaction of uh, commercial interest and to preserve it for research and uh, exhibition. To, to try to avoid the counterproductive effects of the English reading of Article 303, Paragraph 3. And in fact, the Underwater Convention says uh, that in Article 4, any activity relating to underwater cultural heritage to which, which this convention applies shall not be subject to the law of salvage or law of fines unless it, and there are three conditions which must concur, it is authorized by the competent authorities. So not, no undisclosed underwater activity can take place and is in full conformity with this convention. So it is not intended to the commercial exploitation of underwater cultural heritage and ensure that any recovery of the underwater cultural heritage achieves its maximum protection. So if all the three conditions concur, there is no danger that we have an invitation to the looting of underwater cultural heritage. And this provision, Article 4, was agreed by all states participating in the negotiation, including the United States uh, that participate uh, as an observer, because at that time it, it was not a party to a, a member of UNESCO. And so also the United States, which is a big country, and uh, there are many historical and archaeological societies which are against the looting of underwater cultural heritage and, and are located in the United States concurred with this interpretation that uh, the law of salvage is not applicable to underwater cultural heritage when it can be understood as an invitation to the looting of the underwater cultural heritage. So the effort within the parties negotiating the, the convention was to avoid such a counterproductive interpretation. So uh, now the uh, underwater convention slowly increases its participation. I'm glad to, to see that more and more countries are reflecting about uh, the uh, underwater uh, convention and are willing to become parties to the convention because uh, maybe it is not a perfect convention. Maybe the machinery for the cooperation is uh, quite uh, a, a complex one, but uh, it is uh, the only remedy 
for all those states which care about the preservation of the underwater cultural heritage. It is the only available remedy that we have against uh, uh, counterproductive interpretations uh, of uh, the ANCLOS. So I'm glad uh, to see that uh, some instances of cooperation among uh, states' parties to, to the Convention are now taking place. Uh, the Skerki Bank uh, expedition is uh, the first uh, example taking place in uh, the Mediterranean and uh, uh, negotiations for uh, establishing another example in the Baltic Sea are uh, undergoing. So uh, I'm glad to see that uh, the pace of uh, acceptance of the Underwater Convention is growing because it is uh, the only remedy that we have in international law for the preservation of underwater cultural heritage. And I, I have exhausted my time, and I thank you for your attention. Muchas gracias, Tulio, por esta disertación jurídica. Thank you very much, Tulio, for your highly interesting legal dissertation. Now we give the floor to our third speaker, Edward Lanz, and he will, his presentation will be about the uh, mechanisms for a better implementation of 2001 convention, and also he will tell us about mechanism about mandatory reporting or other systems for better implementation of best practices and, uh, well, as stated by UNESCO. Thank you very much for your kind words. I'd like to start uh, by thanking all the uh, team of the Ministry of Culture and I see the Maria uh, and uh, Pablo and Paloma and all the team for the sorry efficient work you, you did and the very productive weekly meetings we had in order to prepare this, um, this conference. Um, I'd like to give you an overview of the um, ratification uh, situation of our convention and uh, develop the arguments uh, pro and contra the, uh, this uh, ratification and then um, provide more details about the, our tools and uh, networks we have currently to better implement the convention. But please um, let me start uh, by uh, giving an overview of the ratification situation in the world. So as it was reminded, we have 77 states parties currently to our convention. So it's the, I would say, the smallest uh, ratified convention within the culture sector at UNESCO. But we are progressing. It's not an easy convention, as um, Professor Scovazzi um, reminded. It's a technical one, and there are some issues of sovereignty, uh, in, in particular, and territoriality. Um, as you can see, we have only um, um, seven states from Group 1, and not, yes, yeah, seven states from Group 1 who are, for the moment, party to the Convention, including Spain, of course, Belgium, France, Italy, Malta, Portugal, and Switzerland. Um, so in the group one, uh, Western Europe and North America, we still are missing 19 states. So we still have a lot of work to improve this rate. Uh, however, in the past uh, months, we have uh, seen seven new states members joining us. Um, uh, five, sorry, including Gambia, Iraq, Mauritania, Qatar, and Yemen. Um, and you can see in the, on, on the screen that uh, the uh, group 5B, sorry, which is the group of the Arab states, is the one with the best uh, score. 84% of the states members of this group 
have ratified, followed by uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, which is group three, um, and a very low rate for Asia and the Pacific here in yellow. So we are putting also a lot of efforts on uh, ratification and uh, progressing in, uh, in uh, having this, this convention better known and uh, understood and, and implemented. Um, why not ratify the, and then please let me also acknowledge the uh, efforts that Ireland is currently undertaking in, uh, in, uh, the, uh, in progressing towards the ratification of the convention. Uh, we, have, uh, we are closely working with Ireland and uh, they have set up a very uh, comprehensive uh, heritage legislation, a new heritage legislation, and very coherent fr uh, framework with a national strategy. Uh, and it's uh, an exemplary um, process uh, which is uh, being followed right now and we hope that by next year Ireland will be a new state party to the convention within group one, uh, knowing that we are also expecting ratification from states from other groups such as Brazil and we hope that by next year and particu in particular the UN conference on the oceans which will take place in a year uh, we will have new ratifications um, uh, with us. Um, first of all, so why uh, are we um, so uh, weak, so low in ratifications, uh, particularly in our Group 1, uh, Western Europe and North America? Um, we know that there are some um, issues regarding uh, international regulation, um, uh, which may be considered for the states as infringe, infringing on uh, sovereign rights, uh, particularly in territorial waters and the exclusive economic zone. This is an argument that we are of, very often um, 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 ha having uh, in mind and hearing, and uh, with questions of infringement on the right to control underwater heritage within the own jurisdiction of the states. Uh, secondly, there is an issue with the in-situ preservation which might uh, conflict with countries' approaches that uh, favor excavation and removal of, uh, for conservation and display. So these are legal and technical issues. Um, there, are also, uh, there is also the issue of the uh, ratification which uh, generates new uh, legal frameworks, new legislations, new strategies and it's uh, a burden for some administration uh, which uh, are lacking equipment and, and uh, qualified uh, staff and experts to implement uh, these new uh, technical and legal obligations when becoming party to the convention. Uh, from an economic perspective, we have also the issue of um, the um, restriction to some activities, commercial salvage operation, oil and gas exploitations, and fishing. This is also something which uh, we are uh, facing when uh, we are um, calling states to ratify the convention. However, um, I would like to uh, now um, detail, expand on uh, the advantages for uh, becoming uh, a state party to the convention. First of all, becoming party to the 2001 convention is also uh, be part of a global um, a framework which, uh, as uh, Krista said, is made at the cultural sector of six conventions, six treaties, which are covering the uh, cultural heritage in all its dimensions, from the tangible to the intangible dimension, built movable uh, heritage. So being part of the 2001 convention is also strengthening the legal international framework, protecting the, uh, and the, the uh, cultural heritage in all its dimension and for the benefit of humanity, of course. Then in terms of international cooperation, becoming part of the convention is also uh, fostering, strengthening the international cooperation, first of all, for the protection of underwater cultural her heritage, but also uh, for the protection of the um, heritage in all uh, its dimension and components. It's also looting against uh, underwater uh, cultural sites because, uh, as you know, the, the link with the 1970 convention, for example, for the fight against illicit trafficking of cultural heritage is uh, very strong. And um, our conventions are um, reinforcing uh, each other. The links with the 1972 World Cultural and Natural Heritage 
is also uh, obvious. And by becoming party to the 2001 Convention, you, of course, strengthen the, um, the provisions of the uh, 1972 Convention. And we know that in this regard, with the climate change issue in particular, more and more uh, World Heritage sites are becoming partially or totally underwater. And so it is obvious that states need also to uh, complement and implement the 2001 Convention in order to better respond to their obligations under the 1972 Convention. Um, I would like also to uh, stress that by becoming party to the 2001 Convention, you enhance uh, your uh, legal obligations uh, with regard to the protection of underwater cultural heritage, of course within your territorial waters, but also in the contiguous zone and in the exclusive economic zone. Um, and this is something which uh, states uh, have to, um, to understand. And, and as uh, Professor Scovazzi was uh, reminding, there is no overlap, no contradiction with the unclosed convention. On the contrary, um, I would also stress that uh, the 2001 convention establishes some uh, provisions regarding sanctions and enforcement um, through the establishment of legal measures uh, and uh, activities which may harm uh, underwater cultural heritage. So you are um, strengthening the legal framework uh, in, in countering um, activities which may uh, destroy or, um, or um, a fr a fr um, put some fragilities on underwater heritage. In terms of uh, cultural and educational advantages, um, uh, becoming party to the 2001 Convention helps also to uh, enhance the local cultural identity and historical heritage of the nations by protecting significant underwater heritage sites as well as uh, intangible cultural heritage uh, elements which are related to this uh, UCH. Um, and we know that more and more by uh, developing operations and activity in the field, uh, directed at protecting underwater cultural heritage, we also more and more take into account the intangible dimension of uh, this heritage and of the uh, context around this heritage, meaning the uh, participation, involvement of the local communities in our activities, for example. Of course, education and awareness are, uh, is a key point when becoming party to the convention because you increase the public awareness and the education about, about the importance of better knowing the uh, underwater heritage. It's a hidden uh, heritage. It's sometimes difficult for the public at large to understand what it is exactly. And uh, of course, through uh, programs and initiatives such as the Blue Schools, the Blue Economy, uh, joint actions with the World Heritage, uh, the International Oceanographic Commission, uh, the uh, education sector at UNESCO, but also the UNITWIN sector network, the network of the universities. We are also contributing, and you are contributing by becoming party, to the uh, better understanding and protection of the underwater cultural heritage. Of course, uh, when you are party to the convention, you are also party to networks dedicated to uh, the um, education, to the uh, research, uh, scientific research and you uh, participate to the progress which are made with the underwater archaeological community in particular to better uh, research, uh, map, document the underwater cultural heritage and we know that this, there's a huge work uh, still to implement in this regard um, because we know that there are wrecks and underwater cultural her heritage sites all over the world and uh, very few are known for the, for, for the moment. The academic collaboration is a key point for us and for you. Uh, we have some UNESCO chairs. Uh, we have three uh, currently in, in Egypt, uh, in France and Portugal. And we, of course, would like to develop more of these specialized chair on underwater archaeology because they're doing a great work in the, in the field and uh, helping a lot uh, UNESCO to operationalize the uh, convention. Uh, then the knowledge sharing is also a very important point as through uh, conferences, seminars, workshops, we are also, uh, and, and also through the uh, meeting of states parties and I would say statutory meetings we have at UNESCO, we uh, allow states and experts to share their knowledge, experience and best practices 
and uh, support other states in implementing uh, similar activities in their countries. Regarding sustainable tourism, um, it's uh, without no doubt uh, an advantage to become party to the convention. You know that promotes sustainable cultural tourism, attracting tourists interested in maritime history and underwater cultural uh, archaeology and wishing to visit and discover underwater heritage in a respectful manner is a key issue nowadays. Mass tourism is really an issue for uh, sites on land but also underwater and uh, through this uh, international normative framework, the 2001 Convention, we are also contributing with our uh, partners and stakeholders, NGOs, uh, diving um, um, clubs, etc., to better regulate and educate the people to the respect and the, the fragility of these sites, and they deserve a very specific approach. Um, we, I would like to mention that we have an international fund which is associated with the 2001 Convention and when becoming a party to the Convention you can benefit uh, from a, a financial support from this fund, from a capacity building point of view, communication point of, point of view, education point of view. So this is also a point which needs to be uh, stressed. Um, from an uh, environmental point of view, I was mentioning our collaboration, our work with the International Oceanographic Commission and the um, encouragement we have to uh, promote towards the integration of cultural heritage into the preservation with marine conservation efforts, promoting the protection of underwater ecosystems. This is also a very key uh, issue and uh, we, uh, with our colleague uh, Marnix and uh, the uh, Ostend um, Marine Center, uh, also working a lot to uh, um, integrate the cultural dimension into the uh, marine, marine science and marine conservation efforts. Um, from a diplomatic and strategic uh, point of view, um, of course, it's the uh, international cooperation which the, con the, the, the Convention fosters. Uh, you know that there is a very sp a specific mechanism which is set in the Convention, Article 10, to promote this international cooperation mechanism and a very concrete uh, example was uh, put in, um, came to reality through the uh, mission that we sent uh, in August 22 in the Mediterranean Sea uh, between the channel of Sicily and uh, between Sicily and Tunisia. Um, so exploration archaeological mission uh, on the Italian continental shelf and Tunisian continental shelf and uh, involving eight states um, all uh, around the Mediterranean. And um, we have to say that despite the uh, challenges and the diplomatic and political um, challenges we, we had to go through. It was a success because it was the first uh, time in the history of the Convention that we were implementing this international cooperation mechanism uh, with a lot of uh, scientific um, um, results, very uh, tangible results because we found uh, three uh, new wrecks in these waters and there are many others to discover but uh, also in terms of cooperation and exchange of uh, knowledge and, um, and very practical um, uh, yes, cooperation between uh, all these underwater archaeologists and scientists coming from these eight states uh, uh, around the Mediterranean which are all party to the convention. Uh, last but not least, becoming party to the Convention is also a question of international prestige and recognition that you are getting from the international community in view of the efforts your administration and your uh, um, uh, national authority are undertaking to uh, join the international efforts to protect the uh, heritage of humanity. And it's also um, and um, an example of the uh, understanding that you, and you uh, fully comply with the shared responsibility to protect the underwater cultural heritage. So this global recognition and the soft power that it gives you also and gives to your national authorities in terms of cultural diplomacy and um, protecting heritage and moving towards uh, a better understanding of the heritage in other countries is also a uh, dimension which has to, take, to be taken into, uh, into account. 
Um, I would say that also uh, becoming party to the convention um, um, means also that you, um, you understand and you commit to uh, apply the rules of the annex which are, um, uh, join, which are accompanying the convention. So these uh, rules which are more of a technical and scientific nature and which are a kind of framework to uh, conduct uh, excavation and uh, um, um, proper uh, protection of the underwater cultural heritage. And it's interesting to, to note that these rules are recognized and acknowledged by states which are not yet party to the convention. For example, the US or the UK are recognizing that these rules of the annex are important and needs uh, some uh, very um, uh, dedicated attention. So it's a first step for these states uh, towards the ratification and we hope that in the forthcoming years, especially in the uh, North America, uh, starting with Canada, which was a, a very active uh, state in the negotiation and adoption of the convention, uh, they will become party. Now I would like also to, if I still have a few minutes, um, um, stress that becoming party to the convention um, allows you to benefit from assistance and from support um, so uh, through various uh, dimensions and various missions. Assistance missions such as the one which um, had uh, very recently in the Dominican Republic with the support of the uh, Spanish cooperation um, to document the underwater culture heritage around uh, the um, La Isabella in the Dominican Republic. I'd like also to stress three evaluation missions that uh, we have had uh, very recently, starting with one in Croatia, in uh, Kaftat, Litavica, and Baron Gauch in May 2024. And uh, some expert, um, Laden um, Pesic will be with us uh, this afternoon, I think. Miley Royo from Estonia was participating in this mission. Uh, which was um, an assessment mission because these sites in Croatia uh, were um, um, recognized uh, by uh, UNESCO and the meeting of states party uh, as uh, best practice in the management and the access to the public to these sites. So it's a kind of international recognition, a UNESCO designation that you are getting from the international community for the efforts that you are putting in place in managing and promoting in the, um, in, in the sense uh, um, recommended by the provisions of the convention um, for the management of these sites. Same for Baia, the Parco Somerso di Baia in Italy, in the south of Italy, uh, which is uh, currently benefiting from this uh, best practice designation and is also uh, deserving a lot of attention from the Secretariat uh, and the, the meeting which are in the uh, scientific and technical advisory body of the convention. We are also uh, having um, a mission in, uh, in Oyo Negro, uh, which is uh, being prepared in Mexico with uh, international experts uh, to um, promote and recognize the efforts that Mexico is uh, investing in promoting and uh, preserving this uh, very important site in this region of the world. Um, last but not least, our cooperation networks, I mean, the convention in itself would not exist and would not be uh, efficient without uh, the, uh, our networks. Starting with, of course, our unit win network. I was mentioning the chairs we have in three uh, countries, uh, in three uh, states, parties to the convention. We have 52 universities which are partners and one category two center, which is the International Center for Underwater Archaeology in Zadar. Mladen Peshik will talk to us more about that. And of course, we have the staff members, 14 staffs for the moment, uh, coming from um, all the regions which are party to the convention. We are for the moment missing uh, experts from the Asia and the Pacific because we have a very low uh, rate of ratification. So this is the, it's a proportion between the rate of ratification and the number of experts from each region we can have in the stub. But you can see that all of them are very knowledgeable and well-known and recognized experts and we are calling upon their support and sending them in the field 
to um, support UNESCO and our field offices uh, in particular to assess the situation of the underwater cultural heritage and implement technical uh, exploration mission. So a very big thank you to all these experts for the, the efforts uh, they, they bring to, to us. Um, of course, we are conducting a lot of regional trainings and capacity building initiatives all over the world. Um, you have an example in Southeast Asia last October, uh, in, in Mozambique, but also uh, in, in Latin America, in the Mediterranean, in the Arab world, um, in Eastern and Western Africa. And of course, we need a lot of support from, from all the member states uh, to, to better uh, implement and train uh, archaeologists, underwater uh, experts, uh, divers, but also um, raise the awareness of the local population and the local community about all the benefits they can get from being part to the convention. Um, of course, there are some very important archaeological and the scientific uh, congress which are organized. Uh, a very important one will be the ICUA in Austin uh, next year, and the Marnix will tell us more about that. But of course, we are supporting all these initiatives that you may wish to undertake uh, to uh, promote in the best manner possible uh, our convention. That's all for the moment. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much to the three speakers for your presentations. I think we have some time for questions and answers for those of you who may have questions. If you don't have questions, I already have some interesting questions already. Thank you to all of you for your extremely interesting presentation. Uh, a single question to, to you, Edward. As you have rightly uh, pointed out about this interlinkage between underwater culture heritage and the living heritage, intangible culture heritage, if you could uh, explore more on these uh, links, how, how it works in practice. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Yes, indeed, it's, it's a very relevant and um, uh, burning issue for us. Um, more and more we realize that <coughs> the Convention, of course, aims to protect <coughs> the tangible heritage, <coughs> wrecks and uh, sunken cities, but such activities cannot be undertaken without the uh, consent and cooperation of the local communities and local population. Very concretely, last year we had a mission that we sent in Guatemala in late Lake Atitlan. It was a stab mission with international experts and to um, assess the state of conservation and, um, and um, 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 I would say discover uh, some wrecks in Lake Atitlan, but such mission could not be undertaken without a prior consent of the local community, the indigenous community living there. Um, uh, for this community, the lake was a sacred space. So we have to take into account also all this um, spiritual, uh, traditional, uh, ritual dimension of, of, of the places and the heritage. Uh, which it is, which is, it, it is embodied in, in, in the heritage being built or sunken or inland. And with the prior consent of the local community, the, uh, our missions are facilitated, are even supported by, by, by these communities because they understand better what we are doing, that it's a respectful uh, um, uh, mission activity that we are undertaking, and that they can uh, get some benefit also from our missions in terms of recognition, in terms of enhancement of the cultural value of this heritage, and even in terms of uh, economic uh, benefit they can get from a sustainable tourism which can be developed through local museums and, um, and tours for, for tourists. Yeah. Thank you. Mm.
um, it is true that there is a very close link between tangible and intangible heritage. Actually, if we focus on the 2001 convention, there is some objects that may be perfectly labeled as underwater cultural heritage, that because they are still in use, they are automatically out of the convention. And this is when the 2003 convention comes to help the 2001 convention. For example, thinking about the fishing traps that are still in use in so many countries, uh, but that they include um, tangible objects that may be. But on the contrary, we are facing very complex and bitter discussions um, when dealing with the protection of um, UCH in the area. Next July, we will have the meeting of the authority, of the seabed authority, and there is a complex problem about how to protect the so-called pure intangible heritage, that is, knowledges, traditions, skills, because tangible objects associated to these skills, knowledge, can be perfectly protected by the 2001 Convention. But the other one is really complex to address, and indigenous peoples, um, their representatives in the working group of, on, on these um, are trying to push um, uh, different states not to forget that the oceans in general, not a small lake, which is a, a little bit easier to, to manage, but the ocean, the entire Pacific Ocean, is closely linked to the intangible heritage, how to manage this different and sometimes contradictory um, interest in this negotiation is being absolutely a nightmare. Thank you. Yes, on, on the question of the link between uh, tangible and uh, intangible, I could recall uh, what happened during the negotiation. A at a certain moment, uh, Australia asked a question. They said they wanted to protect an area uh, where there is uh, absolutely nothing. Whether the convention allowed them to protect the area. And everybody asked why. Why do you protect uh, an area where there is nothing? There is no wreck, uh, there is no submerged city, there is no uh, ecosystem to protect. Why? And they said, because it is an area close to the northeastern territory of Australia, and in this territory the indigenous populations live. It is reserved for the indigenous population. And the local people dream that their divinities are born in that area. So it is our desire to protect a dream. So it is a typical example of link between tangible and intangible heritage. In this case, the intangible does not exist. It's only a dream, but it deserves to be protected. Alguna pregunta más? Any other questions? Skovadzi, thank you for your very interesting talk. But I was thinking, you, 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 I understood that salvamento means something else than salvage. Is there a way of changing the English wording of the text, or is that a too simplistic idea? Because if, salva if salvage includes also rex and salvamento not, Maybe it's, we should try to change the wording of the English text. Maybe it's too optimistic or too simplistic. <coughs> it's not a question of meaning of words. That's a question of legal understanding of words. So in Spanish and in French, salvamento means to save navigating 
ships. You engage in salvamento when you try to save a ship which is in peril, according to an agreement with the captain of the ship and so on. But salvamento does not apply in the French or Spanish legal tradition to wrecks, to ships which are already underwater, which have been lost. So salvamento applies only to navigating ships. On the contrary, according to the English tradition of admiralty law, salvage applies also to the recovering of wrecks from the seabed. So the legal meaning of the word is much broader in English than in French or in Spanish. So that's the question of legal meaning of the word. So it is not possible to translate salvage into French or Spanish because the concept in legal terms is not the same. So that's why we have a different meanings of the same provision if it is read in English or in the other official languages of the Convention. Tamás, any other questions? Real, Professor. Well, I've got a question for Professor Aznar. You mentioned the neutrality of the Convention 2001, Spain, because of the busy traffic for throughout many centuries with Latin America has got many vessels uh, with a U.S. flag. So how is it possible to conciliate the internal rights, internal law of the country and according to international jurisdiction over those vessels, the principle of cooperation with the coastal states, uh, taking into consideration the different uh, situations that the Kingdom of Spain might face in the future. Well, the thing is that there is not a simple solution. The only possible solution would be um, reaching an agreement between the flag state and the coastal state. What do I mean by this? Um, I mean that we, from the Kingdom of Spain or the United Kingdom, uh, Italy, uh, France, Portugal, the main historical naval powers, consider that our uh, state vessels, specifically uh, sunken uh, war state uh, or state war vessels, continues uh, being uh, public uh, property, uh, regardless of where the wreck is located, and we elevate to the category of international law principle that on the contrary, if we go to other geographical areas, for instance, Latin America, uh, with the exception of the Mexican case, uh, where uh, its legislation has um, um, amended that and it incorporates the principle of national sovereignty in the rest of Latin America, Argentina, Cuba, Ecuador, Colombia, etc., they do uh, state that what has been found in their territorial waters, because it has been found in their territorial waters, d does belong to them, belongs to them. Therefore, we've got two legal positions which are irreconcilable. So what can we do? If we say that uh, international law is applicable and we argue or we invoke the convention, in my opinion, the Convention basically would say, I do not deal with that, so please refer to the international law. And in international law, we have nothing regarding that. We only have a reference to the immunity of sunken state war vessels. In the international law, there is um, a consistent uh, and clear uh, practice 
methodology which is uh, applied by a small number of countries, a small number of states. The other states say that this is not a, an international law rule and they say please do not invoke the convention because I'm not part of the convention. And please do not invoke an international law rule because I do consider that that rule does not exist or at least does not is not applicable to me. Therefore, we have reached an, a moment in time where we, as flag state, do have a position and the coastal state has got another position. So what can we do? We cannot send our fleet. Therefore, an agreement should be reached, any type of agreement, an agreement that would provide especially for the protection of that wreck because otherwise practice would tell me uh, would tell us that um, within among this argument between a flag state and the coastal state there will come uh, treasure hunters and will uh, get or oh, loot the uh, heritage so let us conclude this uh, panel Thank you very much to all the uh, speakers, and now let us pause for coffee. Thank you very much to all of you.